So, our second day of Aristotle, um, we're looking at, we're jumping from the topics all the way into another work, and we're not starting at the beginning, we're going all the way to book six. You might say, why are we doing that? Well, because book six of the Nicomachean Ethics actually has to do with some of the things that we were talking about in the topics. It has to do with um, what Aristotle calls intellectual virtues. You notice I've got a lot of terminology up here on the board. And all these things sort of fit into one big, one big picture. And if you had to say, what is this a picture of? This is a picture of the human mind and its activities. Less than that. Um, Aristotle begins by talking about the soul. Or if you're not, you know, you can think about that as the mind or the personality, however you, you want to conceive of it. And what it does and what its parts are. So there's a part of us, there's a part of our way of being that we share in common with all living things, right? Um, what do we do? We eat, we sleep, we digest, you know, we grow. And do you have to think about any of those sort of things? I hope not. You know, maybe your digestion every once in a while when you're not feeling well, right? And you, you, you're upset about, you know, how things are turning out uh, in, in your stomach. You think I shouldn't have eaten that whole pizza or... Uh, I'll never drink again, that's another common refrain. None of you guys do that because you're all in your age, but um, I remember college days. So um, what else do we do, though? We, we feel things, right? We sense things. You know, you're hearing me right now with your sense of hearing, you're seeing, we're seeing each other. Um, you have a sense of smell, which is not particularly acute compared to other animals, you know, like dogs and cats. Uh, sense of taste. Actually, your sense of taste is, in some ways, a bit more refined than, than other animals. And then what else? Touch, right? And that comprises a lot of things. But you also feel other things, too, don't you? What are, what are other things you feel? There's different emotions. sense of feel. What? Emotions. Emotions, right. You feel all sorts of emotions, you know, like anger, sadness, happiness, surprise. These are some of the basic emotions. Admiration. Uh, jealousy. We could go into all sorts of ranges, like you know, there's anger and then there's rage. You know, um, is there a difference? Well, that, we're not going to worry about that today because we're sort of building our way upwards. Uh, you also feel desires too, right? You feel all sorts of desires for and against certain things, and you may not think about your desires that often because some of them are just sort of in the back of your mind. You know, like for instance, what got you here today? on a day where almost everybody is, has off in this area. Um, just the sheer desire to sit in a class and hear about Aristotle and ask questions about that sort of thing? Probably not. You guys have other desires, right? I, there, and it competed with desires, like the desire to sleep in. How many of you would have liked to have slept in this morning? Yeah, me too. Um, Eight o'clock class, that's one of the perils of it. Um, why are you here? I mean, by the end of class, maybe you'll say, yeah, I kind of enjoyed learning about Aristotle, but let's be honest. Is that what motivated you and got you to put on, you know, warm clothes and head across campus or those of you who drove in to drive in, start your car, you know, get, 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 get going over here? What got you here? Yeah. Didn't want to fall behind. Hmm. Okay, perfectly reasonable. Now, that's something that you think about, right? I don't want to fall behind. And you actually start planning out, well, what do I have to do in order to not fall behind? You start weighing things in your mind. You know, the bed is, is warm and soft, and I'm still kind of tired. And it'd be nice to do that. And then I can have a leisurely morning, get up and maybe make some eggs or you know, toast or whatever it is you like for breakfast. Go out for breakfast, you know, at the diner. And then you think to yourself, yeah, but it's early in the semester. I don't think I can afford to take one of those days yet. You know, maybe later on, you're thinking about things, right? That has to do with your mind, but you're also feeling. That has to do with your desires. And we share our desires in common with other animals. Animals desire things, right? How many of you have pets? Dogs, cats, or snakes, spiders, whatever it is. Um, do your pets have desires? How do you know? They do it repeatedly. They do things repeatedly? How, how else do you know that they have desires? They pester you, right? What do cats pester you for? Food and love. 
Yeah, yeah those are probably the biggest ones, yeah. Uh, and if they're an inside-outside cat, let me out, let me in, you know, sometimes over and over and over again. Um, they express their desires. They let you know. You act, they're intelligible to you. You can actually say, yeah, the cat actually wants to go out. It doesn't want me to play with it. You're able to read that, right? You can do that with human beings as well. Part of that, Aristotle doesn't come out and say that that much, but part of that might actually be what he calls practical wisdom. Um, are any of you familiar with this term emotional intelligence? There's a famous book that came out almost 20 years ago called Emotional Intelligence and got this whole movement started. It's kind of big in business and psychology. Um, <laughs> a lot of that is, is actually a matter of what Aristotle is calling phronesis, or practical wisdom. And if you notice, that book actually begins with a quote by Aristotle uh, from the Nicomachean Ethics, having to do with anger and how to tell whether you know, it's the right time, the right place, that sort of thing. Now, we're working our way up into these more intellectual things. But the basis of our being is not just having a, a brain, being an intellect, being purely logical or anything like that. It's desire. It's affective, we would say. Feelings matter. Emotions matter. All those sorts of things are sort of feeding into to all of this. Even when we're talking about the very highest levels of things, like wisdom or intuition of first principles, um, why do people actually pursue that sort of thing? Because they desire it. Why does somebody study philosophy? You know, is it for some, some extrinsic thing like the, uh, the big paycheck? Not a lot of philosophers get a lot of money. Uh, what else could possibly motivate you? Um, being famous. Is studying philosophy a good way to become famous? Especially in the age of YouTube. If you want a YouTube video that's going to get a lot of hits, probably don't do philosophy, do something else, right? Something outrageous. Um, why do people study this sort of stuff throughout the years? It might puzzle you. You know, if you might, you're reading this for the first time, you might, you might say to yourself, God, I can't believe anybody reads this crap. Right? Yeah? Catches curiosity. Okay, and curiosity is a kind of desire, right? And when your curiosity has been satisfied, what do you feel? Enlightened. You feel smarter. A weight off your shoulders. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes you feel a sense of being more alive. You feel pleasure. Pleasure is also something that, that is a matter of the soul, too. And all of these can involve pleasures and pains. The process of learning itself can be pleasurable or painful. Um, when you actually desire these sorts of things uh, for their own sake, that's what motivates you to, to acquire them, to learn. I mean, you can acquire some of these on, on the way for other things, too, especially scientific knowledge and skill. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, now, let's start moving up into the realm of the, the intellect, the, the higher part of the soul, according to Aristotle. This is what makes us different from the animals, the other animals, because we are animals. We share in common with the animals this basis of desire, affectivity, having basic drives, all this, this sorts of stuff. But we're the rational animals. Remember last class we, we started, you know, or we, we, we got into it at the very end. We talked about what makes a human being a human being. What's distinctive about you that separates you from your pets? You know, your pets are probably pretty smart, but they're not anywhere near as smart as you. You're on a very different level. It's all of this stuff. The intellect. When we talk about the intellect, we're talking about the part of you that reasons. The part of you that thinks things out, that weighs, that considers, that says this is the right thing, this is the wrong thing, this is true, this is false. Um, this goes beyond mere perception. You know, for example, what would this, let's say you don't know about iPhones, what could this be to you as you're looking at it? You're seeing it, right? That's perception. What could you say about it? It's a metal. I guess. So there's metal inside of it. This is, a, this is plastic and stuff, but yeah. Paperweight. Well, you might identify it as a paperweight. Okay. Uh, what else can you say about it? Is it? If it's a paperweight, it should probably be heavy, right? Hard to tell looking at something whether it's heavy or not. 
rectangular, white, multicolored. That's about it. How do you identify this as an, as an iPhone? You're using something like knowledge. You're using something that goes beyond what your dog or cat has. You can identify this as a piece of technology, right? You do this sort of thing all the time without thinking about it. You make sense out of your world. You make sense out of your activities. You do this in ways that are usually less than conscious. What Aristotle's trying to do is call our attention to what's going on there and how do we do it well. All of that is a matter of the intellect. The intellect is what allows you to grasp things in their full meaning. So now, any, anything that you have, any sort of organ or capacity or ability, you could, you could develop it, right? Or you could let it just sort of founder. You guys are developing your intellects here at, at Marist because you're in college. Um, is this the only place you could develop your intellect? No, there's lots of other colleges. Is there, do you have to go to college to develop your intellect? There's other things you could do, right? Um, like if you didn't go to college, what would be your other likely career path? Yeah. The military. Yeah, military. And that, so actually, in the military, they send you to school, right? If you're going to be an officer, non-commissioned officer. I suppose even AIT is kind of, depending on your MOS, is kind of a school. Um, or does the Marines have? It? It's like an MOS. I forget what they call it. MOS school, but before that we have our um, combat training. Yeah. Now, a lot of that would be a matter of what Aristotle's calling skill. Um, what if you went to a trade school? Or, you know, vocational technical school? You'd be learning things, right? You'd be developing your intellect. This isn't the only place that you could do that. Um, when you go into a school, you should look very different coming out of it, right? If you put in four years or two years or however long, and you're exactly the same person coming out as you were going in, somebody got screwed. Somebody, you know, took advantage of somebody, right? Either you like went in and you didn't do any work, and that's not gonna not gonna help, right? Or you went in and they didn't teach you anything. If that's the case, then you didn't develop your intellect. They didn't develop your intellect, you didn't develop your intellect. If you actually came out and you learned something, you have developed some part of your intellect. So what are the different parts of our, our intellect? Aristotle, this is not the only way you can divide them, but Aristotle divides them into the theoretical intellect, and he thinks that's a higher part, and the practical intellect. Um, when we talk about something being theoretical, what does that, what does that bring to mind for you? Right off the bat. Abstract. Okay, abstract, that's that's good. What else? Unproven. Well, actually not necessarily unproven, because that'll it could be, but but very often theorizing is, is a matter of proving. Yeah. But there are different perspectives and different forms of it? Well, okay. That could also apply to practical mm -hmm. things too, but that, that, that's yeah. What else? Um that is pretty like agreed upon. Hopefully. I mean, if you have a good, well-defined field, it, it is. Um, if you're contrasting something that's theoretical to something that's, that's practical, what about theoretical things? Yeah. They're intangible. Sometimes, yeah, especially if we think about, you know, sort of high-level theory. You know, mathematics, for example. Everybody can say, you know, 1 plus 1 equals 2, and if somebody doubts that, what can you do? Uh, you know, so I'm going to here we go. On. There's one thing, there's another thing, now count them up, right? That's not intangible, is it? You can, you can actually see them, you might say, oh, put them together, they're just one thing now, you know, be tricky about it, but no, these are two things. But, you know, go a little further in mathematics and start introducing X and Y and stuff like that and talk about slopes. Okay, now you can kind of visualize it a bit and you can look at things in the real world and, and say, yeah, okay, there's, there's a, a hill that's got a slope, you know, I go sledding, if the slope is higher, I go faster, I understand that. But now we get to an even higher level when we start thinking in terms of calculus and rates of change and measuring those and limits. And now we're talking about things that are very intangible, right? What are you, you going to say, Mr. Uh, uh, Anasta? You had your hand up. No, oh, I, was, I asked already about, um, what was it, about, it was agreed upon. Okay, yeah. 
Um, and there are such things in calculus like um, objects of rotation. Yeah, I mean, we could go like on all sorts of things. Yeah. Some of them we can get our we can get our head around and see. Others are sort of abstract. Think about economics. Law of supply and demand. Has anybody ever seen the law of supply or demand? You can see people buying and selling things, making prices. You can't actually see the law of supply and demand, even if they do put it in a textbook. So yeah, there's a certain degree of intangibility as we get to higher levels. Again, that can apply to the practical intellect, too. Think about um, artwork. People who are great artists. What actually separates their work from other art that's kind of schlocky? Is that something that you can put your finger on and you say, well, this part of the painting, that's it right there, that brush stroke, that did it. It might be something intangible there too, the practical matters. Um, think about this, theoretical matters, why do you study theoretical matters? Yeah. Sometimes impact the practical. Say again? To impact practical thought. They may have applications, yeah. But oftentimes you study them for their own sake. Because you're interested in knowing about X, Y, Z. I mean, if you study biology, then you might be able to go on and become a doctor, go on to you know, medical school, or you might you know, work in a laboratory or something like that. But that's not what studying biology is really about. That's not what the discipline of biology is about. And that's not what the part of your mind that's working with that and learning it is really focused on. Um, as, as a matter of fact, if you do that, if you only focus on practical applications, you will not, in fact, thoroughly learn the theoretical thing that you're studying. If you turn everything into a matter of the practical intellect, you will not be good at whatever it is, whatever theoretical thing you're, you're trying to learn. You'll miss some things. Because the theoretical intellect is concerned with things that we study, you might say, for their own sake, so we can know about them. Also, according to Aristotle, it studies things, it pays attention to things that don't really change. Again, mathematics. Somebody says um, 1 plus 1 plus 1 is uh, 2 today, or is 3 today, but it'll be 2 tomorrow. What would you say to them? No. You, you could say no. You could say you're nuts. Like, why would you say something crazy like that? Um, mathematics is, you know, one of the things we like about it is it's fairly unchanging. Physics. Okay, models of physics have changed over time. As a matter of fact, Aristotle's own ideas about physics that now we don't actually buy into, because um, you know people like Galileo proved some of them wrong, and then people also proved you know things wrong about later things. But the idea is that there's some constants, and if you're studying this this thing, this discipline, if it's a matter of the theoretical intellect, you can tell you've got things right when things are agreed upon, and you can count on them being the same, right? Um, is that the case in everything? In practical matters, it's a lot harder to come up with perfect rules that make sense out of everything. Does that mean that we don't have knowledge? That we don't have any sort of, nobody's, you know, any better off than anyone else? No. There are, when we get to the level of particulars, when we're dealing with things that have what we call pragmatic aims, um, practical applications, things get a lot murkier than they do in these higher, you know, more pristine levels. The practical intellect is, is not so concerned with understanding for its own sake. It's, un it's interested in understanding for the sake of something. Oftentimes, action. How to make something. How to do something. Whether we're doing the right thing. Whether we're doing the wrong thing. Those are the sorts of things that the practical intellect is concerned with. So now think about this. Have you been doing that sort of thing your entire life? Yeah. The question is, um, have you been doing it well? Or have you been doing it poorly or somewhere in between? Have you been working on trying to get better in these sorts of things? And I'll put it in a very practical way. What are you actually doing here at Marist College in terms of what it is that you're studying, not just in this class, 
but all the other classes that you're studying. I know some of you are undeclared at this point, but you will have majors probably by the end of this year, this, 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 this uh, academic year, or at least you know, by next semester. Um, who knows, some of them may be philosophy, I can only hope. But um, you will be studying something that you want to actually get right, that you actually want to understand. That might be something for the theoretical intellect, or it might be something of the practical intellect. Yeah? Um, could it be like if we're not learning, if we're not going to go into the profession, like philosophy, that this class would be practical for us? Well, it, it, it could be practical in a certain sense. Well, it could be practical in two senses. One is, there's no better, if, if it's done well, there's no better training for your intellect than philosophy classes. Philosophy majors actually on, on you know, like the graduate record exam, the, law, the LSAT exam, among the highest classes. Why is that? Well, because it trains your mind in ways that other disciplines tend not to. So it could have a practical application. I'm going to be a philosophy, I'm going to study philosophy so I can do well on the LSAT because I want to go to law school. <coughs> that, that would be practical, right? Um, could be, it could be serving some sort of practical end in another way because you need this class in order to make it through, right? You have to, you have to take intro because it's a required class so you can graduate eventually in what you're more interested in studying. So there could be a pragmatic aim there too. Yeah, this could be practical in a sense. If you actually start enjoying this and start wanting to know, well, why, why did Plato say that? And start thinking about it. Now you're actually dealing with things that are probably more theoretical. And this other part of your intellect gets, gets engaged. Um, now, you notice I've got all these other terms up here. What's, what's going on with those? Well, Aristotle talks about five kinds of what he calls intellectual virtue. Virtue is not a word that we use an awful lot, and we're not going to study it very much in this class. We do that more in ethics class. Um, we'll, we'll touch on it here and there, you know, when we read Cicero and Augustine and some of these other people. But we're not going to study, study it for its own sake. What a virtue is is a kind of excellence, a kind of doing things well, things functioning the way they ought to. So um, let's take a few examples. This, this chalk, I suppose you could say, is the virtue of being able to, you know, show up well on, on the chalkboard. Whereas some of this other stuff that they give us, like this colored chalk, uh, you know, not so good. Also, this chalk is dense, feels good in the hand. This colored chalk is flimsy, and I hate working with it. Um, this makes a bad sound on the chalkboard, too. So that's a very trivial uh, way of thinking about things. Um, how many of you... Are, are musicians in any sense? You play an instrument. What do you, what do you play? Um, piano and guitar. Oh, wow. Those are, do you want to be like a, a songwriter? Because you couldn't pick any two better for, for composing. Piano and guitar, those are pretty much it. You know? Um, what makes a person a good piano player? Um, practicing a lot. Okay. That's, that's sort of on the, on the back end. That's what turns them into a good piano player. How do you know they're a good piano player? Yeah, and there's, and there's a lot of intangible things to that too, right? You, you like listen to somebody and you're like, mm, that just doesn't sound right. And, you know, you can, they can say, what's wrong with my playing? Well, I mean, your tempo is off, hit the wrong notes, and then there's something else about your playing I don't like. Right? You, you know, you've heard people get those sort of reports. A good piano player has a certain virtue. A bad piano player might actually have a certain kind of vice. Now, is that a matter of the intellect? Yeah, that's a matter of the intellect. That's a matter of being able to do something well, what Aristotle calls technique or skill or art, being able to play an instrument. Um, how many of you like to play anything athletic, some, some sort of game? Okay, so did you have to do any development of your skills for that? What happens if you don't develop your skills? Well, what, what happens to the people who say, I don't want to do drills, I just want to play the game. In your experience. Nothing happens to them? They're not able to play the sport well. Yeah, and don't they actually fall behind? They may actually start out with some real good, you know, original talent. Talent, by the way, can be, can be a killer for people. People start out talented, they're like, I don't need to learn anything from anybody. Art students are the worst for that. They, somebody tells them in high school, oh, you're such a talented artist, 
and they come in, and I know this because I used to work for art departments, they come in and they're like, I don't need to study any of this stuff, the art history, that's complete, you know, waste of time, I don't even need to like do drawing class because I just want to paint. And then the art teacher will be like, no, you actually got to learn drawing before you do painting because the skills from one build into the other, they feed into each other. And what happens to the people who have talent but don't, don't actually do any development of technique? They fall behind. Everybody else who didn't actually have so much talent, they, pro they progress, don't they? Because what they're doing is they're developing their practical intellect. The other person is just kind of sitting still. What about theoretical intellect? Does anything like that happen? I can tell you that it does because I coasted through high school and actually a large part of college. I was very smart. You know, I, I got like high test scores and stuff like that. And I read, I read a lot of stuff, but I didn't read what the teachers would assign to me, because I, I was kind of a, you know, a smart, you know, smart aleck, right? Uh, you know the other word. Um, and I didn't want anyone to tell me what to do. So um, what I found is I didn't actually learn a lot in high school. Why not? Because I didn't actually study the things that I should have studied that they assigned to me, because I thought I knew better. And then I got to college, and I went to, I didn't go to a place like Marist, I went to a, a much, you know, lower grade college where it wasn't, it wasn't hard to, to get by and, and to do well. And I didn't really start to apply myself until I got to graduate school and I realized, man, if I actually want to learn stuff and I want to become a better person, if I want to have an excellence of mind, I better start really studying. And then I, I did. Um, and then I was really surprised by how much you get out of it. Before I just sort of, you know, read whatever I wanted to read and you know, hand in papers and just get by, you know. If I got a, if I got a B, that was fine, you know, because it didn't, didn't really matter. Um, well, this is a matter of developing excellences, and that's part of what you're doing here through through your studies. You're developing excellences of the theoretical intellect or the practical intellect. Let's look at Aristotle's scheme now. Uh, let's look at scientific knowledge first. He has this term episteme in Greek. And episteme can be translated as science, it can be translated as knowledge, it can be translated, I think, as well as like disciplinary knowledge. Um, what would be an example of this? Mathematics, or physics, or biology. It's a body of knowledge, and it develops by beginning from certain starting points, and then reasoning about them. So think about when you were taking, all of you took biology class, right, in high school? Um, what did they give you, other than a place to sit, you had a teacher in front of the, the classroom and maybe some things to dissect. What was the biggest thing, uh, the most important thing they gave you for the class? Or maybe you had to buy it. <laughs> textbook, right. Now that textbook wasn't just a whole bunch of things, you know, thrown all together kind of, you know, humble jumble, you know, organization, right? Started out with some very basic principles. What was the first things that you learned about in biology? Do you remember? Cell structure. Exactly. Now why did we start with cells? The most basic thing. Exactly. So you, you begin from starting points, and then you build from those. And some of these things you know, that you're learning in the science, you're doing deductively. You begin from certain principles or premises, and then you reason or argue about them. Others, you have to kind of you know, do experiments. Why do they have you do experiments? Why do they have you dissect things? Or do they still do that? We had to do pigs and worms and frogs. Some, sometimes they have these virtual things, because they don't like us you know, cutting things open anymore. So it's not just like? You're learning about it. It's not just like a theory to you. It's yes. actually you can, act, you can actually see it. Yes, that's that's very important. Being able to see examples of things. Now, imagine that you didn't have a textbook and you had to figure this stuff out on your own. And you're really interested in what makes animals tick. <laughs> what might you do? Yeah. Go get an animal and do it yourself. Now, would it, would it only be one animal, or would you have to do, I mean, maybe the one animal you pick was unusual. I, I would say different, because, I mean, a fish, why does a fish breathe underwater, but a cat okay. can't, so. So let's say you start out with, with that. You see the fish do fine underwater, and um, other animals that fall in the water, after a while they die, right? Um, they're not doing so hot. And you're wondering, how does that happen? How are, how are they able to breathe and stuff? So you get a lot of fish and you pull them out and you look at their common structure and you notice they have these weird things that we call gills and maybe you start dissecting them and start theorizing about them. That's what Aristotle calls induction. You look at a lot of examples and try to figure out what the common element is 
And we do this in a lot of things. Um, you use induction to figure out how to behave with other people. Remember back to when you were a kid on the playground. Um, what's, what's bad about, well, what's good about playgrounds first? You get to play, right? Hopefully. What's bad about playgrounds? Bullets. Scrape knees. Scrape knees, yeah. Sometimes bullies and scrape knees might actually come together. Uh, yeah, other kids are most likely to be their worst problem on a playground. And you, you learn about this over time, right? Um, let's take bullies for an example. You get bullied sometimes, maybe you bully other kids, you see other kids getting bullied. Um, let's say you say, I don't like this bullying stuff. Well, let's say by now you've worked it out of your system, you're not a bully yourself. Um, I don't like this bullying stuff, I gotta, not, I gotta make sure that this doesn't happen to me. Um, now you could start from some sort of deduction. You know, your parents told you certain things like, always stand up for yourself. And you think to yourself, okay, dad says always stand up for myself. That's a starting point, that's a premise. And this is a case where I'm being bullied, so that means it's a case where I should stand up for myself. So I know I need to stand up for myself, and then you start thinking about what does that mean? Um, probably I should pop him in the face. Um, and there's a sort of leap there. Well, that's a deduction. What if you actually like sat back and you watched kids on the playground, and you watched kids being bullied, and then you watched which kids kept on being bullied. And you also observed kids, something happening, and then the kid not being bullied anymore. You know, and you start saying, what's the common element over here? I guess maybe the bully gets transferred to another school, or they get tired of it, or somebody pops them in the face. Um, and you say, pops them in the face seems to be the thing that tends to stop bullying them. And then now you get bullied, and you're like, well, I don't really like being bullied. I'm going to pop this guy in the face. You've done what Aristotle calls induction. You've generalized from experiences. And you also said, because if I don't do that, look at all these other cases where you know this, this kid just says, stop it, don't do that, or you're not really bothering me, or you know, all, all those sort of things that don't work on bullies. Um, or I'll give you my lunch money. Um, you, you look at all these different cases and you generalize from experience, right? Do you do this with other things? Who should you take classes from if you're embarrassed? How do you know? What's that? Rate my professor. Rate my professor. Now, what does rate my professor, and there's a couple other sites out there doing this too, what does rate my professor give you? A score. A score. Is that, is that score by itself everything you look at, though? No. Comments. What? Comments. Now, it's why do the comments matter to you? Because other students who may be similar or may not be similar to you have taken this and touched and spirit, so teachers also. Exactly. You're carrying out induction by doing that without realizing. Now, if you're doing that in a sort of high-level way, you're acquiring scientific knowledge. This is what goes on in a lot of the disciplines. Um, scientific knowledge can't supply itself with its own beginning points, according to Aristotle. These can't actually be provided to us by, by argument or even by necessarily induction. We have to sort of get those. We have to, to realize those. And that's what he calls intuition or intuitive reasoning or noose, which literally just means mind or intellect. Um, and some people have scientific knowledge, but they don't actually have this. So they can do just fine in that science, but they can't tell you why things are the way they are in that science at the fundamental level. This is where you actually get the, the starting points at the fundamental level. So if you ever asked your biology teacher, yeah, but why do cells do the things the way they do? Why are there cells in the first place? That's a higher level question. And your biology teacher might have said, I don't know, shut up and read the textbook. Quit, quit asking so many questions. You know, go take a philosophy class if you want to ask questions like that. Uh, philosophy is kind of the dumping ground for, for students who ask too many questions, by the way, in a lot of places. Um, well, that's because your teacher didn't have this. And if they didn't have this, they probably can't supply you with that either. doesn't mean you can't develop it on your own. It gets a little bit uh, more interesting. What is it to have actual wisdom? That means having both of these. Having the starting points and having scientific knowledge about important things, things that don't change. Like Aristotle you know, was interested in astronomy and biology and things like that. 
logic too. Aristotle arguably is somebody who had wisdom because he possessed the starting points, but he also worked out the scientific knowledge. Now, is that all we have? As a matter of fact, a lot of our life is concerned with the practical, with, with uh, making or doing, rather than just looking at or thinking about. And we inquire about this too, don't we? I mean, do you just do everything sort of haphazard, random? We already know, you know, when it comes to classes, selecting classes, a trivial thing is that. You actually like use, how many of you use Rate My Professor? Almost the whole class. So, you know, just selecting a class, you don't just sort of jump into it. You, I, I imagine that if somebody said to you, yeah, I was in this class with this professor, but I, and, and it's terrible, but I didn't do any checking up on him, you'd be like, that's your own problem, right? You, you created that. You should have thought, thought that through. That's a question of using the practical intellect. How do you know what major you should major? A lot of you are, are you've either decided recently, and you might you know, change your mind, or you're still in the process of deciding. Is that a question of the theoretical intellect? I don't think so. Why are you majoring in the things you're majoring in? Yeah. I've done it already, and it's interesting to me. I'm good yeah. at it. So you know that you actually like it. I hope all of you end up liking your majors. If you don't, you should, you should change it. Yeah. Because they're going to prepare me for something that I like foresee liking in the future as my profession. Yeah. Um, you see it as a means to a end that you desire, right? Uh, any other reasons you might have chosen to major? You're particularly good at it. Yeah, and we tend to be, we tend to like things that we're good at, right? So again, the, it was a pleasure thing. Um, maybe somebody's told you, hey, you're good at this, you can probably make a living at it. That's another reason to do that sort of thing. These are all practical concerns. If you find yourself in a major that's ill-suited for you, don't stay in that major. There's plenty of other things you can study. There's jobs available in all the different fields. You don't, you're not tied. Just because somebody told you you have to study business or, you know, psychology or pick whatever you want, that doesn't mean that you have to study that. Or if somebody pushed you into philosophy and you'd really like to study business, study business because that will actually make you happier, which is what the practical intellect is in part concerned with. Your own good, the good of other people, what's better, what's worse, figuring out these sorts of things, what will get you towards your goals. Now, the practical intellect deals with two different kinds of matters. Some of these are about producing something. It could be a product. Like, what does a musician produce? Music. Music, right, that you can listen to. Right? It could be, you know, music that you actually record and now you sell a CD, right? Or it could be that you're the, the uh, piano player uh, at the, uh, the reception. They hire, you know, a piano player at the reception is, is the person who nobody notices, but it, it makes the place a lot nicer, right? Because there's music being played. People love live music. What is a uh, what does a factory worker produce? Whatever it is that their factory is, is producing. You know, if they're assembling iPhones, iPhones. Um, let me ask a few other questions. What is a what does an architect produce? Build Build structure. Yeah. Um, Nowadays, just the plans, really, to, for that, and then we have contractors who do that. But in Aristotle's time, the architect was the top person, and all these other people would be doing their skills, their productive activities underneath them. What does military science produce? This is kind of a tricky question. The art technology? The art well, of war. the technology is something different. The art of war. What is the art of war, though? What is it, what's its product? What is it supposed to produce? If I have the art of war and you don't have it, Good soldiering, um, the right technology. But ultimately, what's this product end. supposed to be? Oh, winning the war. Winning the war, victory, right. Um, what is a, a, a physical trainer supposed to produce? Fit human being. Fit human being, yeah, you go to Planet Fitness, you know, just down the road. Um, at least according to their ads, they have guys who walk around, they can tell you what to do. Um, I, that should make your body better. Go to the doctor. What is the doctor supposed to produce? A healthy person. Yeah. Now notice with the doctor, you have somebody who has some scientific knowledge, but that's really a productive art. The doctor's not interested in germs and stuff like that for their own sake. They're interested in actually making you feel better, right? Hope. Oh. 
Maybe they're interested in making you feel worse. You never know. They're an evil doctor. Um, now, for all of these arts, crafts, skills, there are certain standards within them, right? You can tell what is good music, what's bad music. If I, if I were to play the piano, I, I don't think I would make very good music. You would probably make much more you know, harmonious music than I would. You have that actual art or skill. Um, I am a good rhetorician. I, you know, I, don't, I don't turn it on too often. But um, I can convince people of things. If you're going into sales, you, you want to become a good rhetorician, actually. Um, if you're going into management, you want to become a good rhetorician. You want to be able to convince people of things, produce conviction in them. That's, a, that's an art. Aristotle actually wrote a whole book called The Art of Rhetoric. It was the first um, scientific study of communication. So any of you who are communication majors, you should probably read Aristotle's book of rhetoric because you'll learn a lot of stuff early, early on. Um, what else are productive arts? Um, any of the things that we call fine arts, those are all productive arts. There are standards for those as well, right? Sculpture, painting, pottery, weaving, I suppose. Um, what else do you think would fit in here? Yeah. Metalworking. Yeah, that is, is a uh, product of art. Um, or, you know, in terms of blacksmithing, you know, forging. We don't have a lot of blacksmiths around these days. We tend to do things through die presses, but it's the same basic idea, right? If you want to become a die press operator, you actually go to school and you learn how to do something. Um, I have a friend who actually is a blacksmith. He has his own forge. He uh, specializes in ancient swords. Um, not a huge call for that, unfortunately. He's, uh, he's, you know, he's getting some, some work, but not done. He's been on Nova. Interesting. Um, now, does that cover everything? Well, there's this realm that he calls practical wisdom. This is a little bit more intangible, too. This has to do with what's good for you on the whole. And if you want to think about a contrast, the art of medicine is a productive art. It tells you, if you want to heal somebody, how to heal them, right? It also gives you the opposite, too. If you, if you wanted to kill somebody, uh, with, with medicine or with drugs or something like that, go go ask a doctor how to do it or a nurse because they'll probably know what you know what would be a good you know dose for an overdose or something. But um, can the art of medicine tell you whether it's a good idea to heal this person or not? Think about a sticky situation. You're a doctor. Think about the sort of. Any of you guys ever watch the show House? I know it's off the air now. Faces all these ethical situations. Should this person be healed or not? And he just doesn't care. Well, he, he does really in his heart of hearts. You know, he, he has a hard exterior. House is somebody who's concerned with practical wisdom when it comes to medicine. Actually, all the people under him are too, and and the people over him. Um, uh, forget his, his friend who eventually becomes the the chief, Mankati, of course, who he screws up by dating. Um, the question of whether you should or not heal somebody. Let's say, here's, here's one that came up in there. Somebody is a, um, he wasn't a dictator, he was a uh, war criminal, right? You, any of you see that episode? Mm -hmm. The guy he had engaged in atrocities. Should he be healed or not? Or would it be better to use medicine to sort of surreptitiously kill somebody? That's not something that the art of medicine can actually tell you. The art of medicine just, can just tell you, well, if you want to heal somebody, here's what you would do. How you should practice medicine, aside from its internal standards, the ethical questions, that's a matter of practical wisdom. Did you have your hand up? Uh, okay. Did you have your hand up? Okay. I'm you ask oh. okay. Um, I run in the ambulance, too, like locally and at home, and a lot of times, Similarly to Dr. House, like you have to make these like subconscious decisions when you pick up people that you know say like are rapists or oh. like aren't very good people, and you know who they are because they're identified in the town in the community, and then say they're in cardiac arrest and you have to perform CPR. It's like, are you really giving it your one hundred percent, or are you not? Because you know that they did this thing to this child in your town that you may know of or not. And yeah, there's some very often faced with that. Yeah, there's some very difficult yeah. questions that come up in medicine. Um, also, you know, another art or skill that we don't tend to think of this way would be like policing. 
criminal justice, right? That is productive of something. What is it productive of? Security, safety, um, or perhaps justice, you know, when people have been harmed. To figure out how to do that well requires a different part of your mind. It requires practical wisdom. So what is, what is practical wisdom? It's the capacity to judge well in things that could go a lot of different ways that are up to human beings, to judge well in terms of moral values, the good and the bad, or the good and the evil, the just and the unjust, what's fair, what's unfair. Um, now, here's what's really interesting. Aristotle thinks that you can have rules for these sorts of things. But the rules can't cover every case. And in order to be able to figure these things out well, you have to develop a kind of sense of judgment, a capacity when you get to sticky cases like that to be able to figure out what the right thing really is. And some people have this and other people don't. Some people are practically wise. Other people, I would say, are practically foolish. And, I mean, the good news is if you're practically foolish, you can be weaned away from that and if you don't yet possess practical wisdom, you can develop it. But you'd actually have to think a little bit about what it is that you're trying to develop in order to do that. It's not going to be something completely haphazard. Um, this is why we have a, a study of ethics in the first place. Because it's not enough just to like, you know, want to be a nice person or a good person. You have to actually you know, work on your mind, on your intellect, on the parts of you that engage in that sort of judgment. So you've got some sort of defensible reasoning why, in fact, you're giving the CPR or not giving the CPR. Putting this person in with the other uh, criminals in holding or taking them out and putting them in, in uh, you know, special area. Uh, yeah? Just going back to the actual, like, house um, category with the uh, war criminal, didn't they actually let him, didn't they murder him? Yeah, it was, it was one of the guys, I forget, the Australian guy, I yeah. think, if I remember right, who, who killed him. Yeah. But then later, throughout the series, he like has an entire like emotional breakdown of the fact that he actually murdered someone. Yeah. yeah. Um, Aristotle was not <laughs> saying, by the way, that if you possess practical wisdom, you will invariably, always, every single time, come to the right you know, realization. If you have it more often than not, you'll, you'll be better at that than the average person. I would say that, that what's that Australian guy's name? I don't remember. Chase, yeah? yeah? Somebody's a Chase, okay. I would say that Chase is somebody who is sort of on the way to having phronesis. I would say that the person who probably uh, on that show is the closest to having phronesis is House's uh, best friend. Uh, the guy with the dark hair, what was his name? Wilson, yeah, yeah. I would say he probably came, came the closest. House was a really interesting series in part because it was set up deliberately to introduce ethical problems that come up with in, in medicine. Uh, you may not have realized that. You may have thought it's all about like solving puzzles, right? That's a matter of the scientific intellect or a matter of art or skill or techne. Um, but really the things that made House the most interesting, the things that actually make most narratives interesting, are these moral questions that come up. Now, what I want to leave you with, remember when we were looking at Plato, Plato was really concerned with this question of knowledge, right? Who has knowledge? Who doesn't have knowledge? Can you, do you have knowledge when you have virtue? What is virtue? All that sort of stuff. Did Plato make any of these sort of distinctions? Or did he lump knowledge all into one big bushel? Aristotle's making distinctions here. He's saying, Scientific knowledge or disciplinary knowledge is, is a whole different animal and actually uses a different part of your mind than does practical wisdom, than does art or skill. So if medicine is down here and mathematics is here, but the good life is actually here, these are different types of knowledge and they would have to be treated differently. Plato may have made some mistakes by putting all these things together and not making distinctions the way that Aristotle was. Yeah? Um, but at the end of the day, don't they all like, work together? Oh, that's a very good question. In, in a person who is well integrated, yes, they ought to all work together. And ideally, here's what Aristotle thinks. 
Aristotle thinks ideally you're going to have both practical wisdom and, and wisdom wisdom, and you're going to spend you're probably not going to spend too much of your time on practical matters. You're going to spend a lot of your time, you know, in contemplation of, of higher things. Um, I'm not so so sure that we'd all be attracted to that, and I'm not I'm not so sure he's actually got that right. I think that sometimes figuring out like what makes people tick, that might be a higher thing. I know for me, and maybe this this applies to some of you. If you're going into business, or you're going into psychology or history or things like that. It's probably at least in part because you're interested in people, right? Or communication. Any communication majors? Um, even fashion, I think, ties into this as well. Fashion is about communication. Um, you're interested in why people do things the way they do. Are a lot of you interested in that sort of thing? Yeah. Why? You know, what makes people tick? What makes a person a good person, a bad person, all that? That's a matter of integrating these different kinds of knowledge. So, you, so you're right. The other thing I'd point out is if you're screwed up in this way, um, you may actually like have scientific knowledge, but you'll use it wrongly when it comes to application. Or you may have you know, skill or technique, but you, you'll use it wrongly. Think about, um, well, here's a good example. Here, here's a danger for those of you that are going into business marketing or, or sales. Um, should you treat every one of your relationships, transactions, involvements, as if it is a sales opportunity. God no. Right? There are certain certain lines you shouldn't cross. Don't make everybody into a client. Now you could be really, really good at what it is that you do. You know, convincing people to buy whatever it is. Not everybody needs to buy whatever it is that you're selling. And what would help you figure that out? Not the art or, or technique that you have. You might be so good at it that you really, like somebody brought up before, you enjoy doing the things you're good at. Practical wisdom is what would tell you, hey, hey, you don't need to sell things to your, to your, uh, your wife, your husband, your father-in-law, mother-in-law, uh, brother or sister. Maybe you can turn the sales pitch off for, for a little while and just enjoy Thanksgiving or whatever, whatever it is, right? Um, and the same thing would go for scientific knowledge. Practical wisdom is needed in order to, to integrate the personality. So, very important question to, to think about. Um, notice practical wisdom for Aristotle is lo located a little bit lower than, than these other things, isn't it? Maybe if it were me, I would actually put practical wisdom at the top. So that's something maybe for you guys to think about. Where, where would you put these different skills? How would you rate these different abilities or capacities that you actually have and that you're working on and you're developing right here at, at Marist College. So that's where we'll leave off.